Good evening. Ooh, ooh, you all are very responsive. Good evening. We'll do it one more time. How are you? Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. My name is Bev Redmond, or Beverly Redmond. I am the Executive Director of Communications and Public Relations for District 205. I want to welcome you this evening. Would you all give yourselves a round of applause for battling flu, all those other things and coming out and being with us tonight. Very pleased that you are here because your presence means that you are dedicated to information and to empowerment and growth. Tonight, we are indeed going to talk about legal marijuana and what it means for our teens. But before we do, I would like to bring you greetings on behalf of our superintendent. His name is Dr. David Moyer, and unfortunately, he could not be here tonight, but he is certainly supporting this particular event. We also have some of our board members, our school board members. If you would just wave your hand for our D205 board members who are in the audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for supporting us and being here this evening. I am very proud to actually be a part of this event. And when we started talking about something like a partnership between the City of Elmhurst Commission on Youth and Thrive D205, we started talking about what would we want for our kids. My daughter's name is Noelle. I have a son named Kelsey. What do I want for them at this particular point? They're 19 and 21 respectively. I would want them to thrive. I would want them to be well. So tonight is dedicated to your child, your family, and being well. Would you allow me to also welcome my co-partner, my co-conspirator in putting this event together, Mrs. Jackie Tamer. She is the chair of the City of Elmhurst Commission on Youth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I wanna start by thanking the Elmhurst Library for hosting us. Leah, thank you so much. Um, and our commissioners who are here because we can't do it without the city commissioners. I think Maurice is here tonight. We also have Danny Palumsky, who is an older woman and she will be here as well to answer some Q&A. Nick Waldemeyer and Tim Jorgensen are also on our commission. They are SROs from um, from York, but they'll also be available for some Q&A. And Beverly forgot to mention, she's a rep on our commission as well. Um, we always have a representative from District 205. So that being said, and thank you also Comcast, Joe and his team for being here as well. This will be available to the community uh, at a later date. And we'll get those dates out. Um, Matt Quinn has been working with adolescents and children for 15 years. He got his bachelor's degree from Notre Dame, and he got his master's from Illinois School of Professional Psychology. He also is an outreach director, is that what, your outreach director with Rosecrans. Uh, today he's speaking part of his private practice. He has been working with the kids at York, the staff at York, um, for providing services there as well in consultation. I'm also proud that York, uh, that Matt has graduated also from York. He grew up here, he graduated here, and I graduated with him, ironically. So please give a warm welcome to Matt Quinn. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out, I appreciate it. One thing that Jackie was kind enough to not mention, because we graduated together, is the irony and how painfully quiet I was in high school, and now, how often I do this is my third night in a row doing these presentations. So they say that people in counseling, in a lot of ways, they're trying to kind of therapize themselves. And I've realized, uh-oh, I think I did it to myself too. By, by forcing myself to be in front of large crowds like this, I think I've you know, helped to overcome some of that. And I'm sure Jackie would attest to it. I think people sometimes wondered if I knew how to talk in high school. So. Um, so thanks for coming out tonight. We, I really, really appreciate it. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing. Um, I know it's hard to get out of the house with sports commitments and, and homework and clubs and all the, you know, the chauffeuring, the Ubering around all your kids and all of those things. So I really, really appreciate you coming out. And hopefully it's a topic and, and you get the information that you're looking for tonight. I wanna make sure to thank not only Jackie, but the Commission on Youth here in Elmhurst, Thrive 205. I love the initiatives that 
Jackie and I have talked about in the community here in terms of Thrive 205. Just seems like there's a, a, an ongoing commitment to mental health and really keeping kids and, and, and making kids well. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thanks, Jackie. I, I really appreciate it. So let's jump right into it. Unfortunately, we have, we're kind of a, in, the, in the middle of this one-two punch that I'm seeing going on, okay? So what you're gonna hear me do throughout the next 45 minutes to an hour is unfortunately weaving together this really huge problem of vaping and then also kind of what we've seen with the legislation around marijuana that we all know about and my concerns about some of the messaging and what it could potentially lead to with youth. We're gonna get into and dive into all that and kind of weave that all together. So I don't put this, all this information that Jackie touched on, I don't put this up here to try, try to make myself seem important. What I think is important is that you understand the context of where I'm coming from. So if I at times seem maybe overly passionate about the impact and concerns that I have about vaping and marijuana and youth, it's all because of what I've seen working with, my, my oldest is 11, I have three little kids. I haven't had to deal with the impact of a lot of this stuff and I hopefully never do. But over the past 15 plus years, I've seen the impact of vaping, I've seen the impact of marijuana, alcohol, all of these things. And so that's the lens that I've seen this through. So this is not gonna be a platform for me to talk about the pros and cons, should this have been legalized, should it, you'll probably hear hints, maybe leaning one way, right? But that's not my platform, that's not my lane. My lane is trying to share information with parents like yourselves and some of the youth that are in the crowd here on what I think are really key components to this, both in research I've done and also just experience working with young people, particularly teenagers over the past 15 plus years and the impact that I've seen it have. So that's, so just consider this kind of that piece to your puzzle in terms of that experience that I've had and some of the research that I'm gonna share for you over the next 45 minutes or so. So before we get to the Grateful Dead and tie-dye and all that, um, what I wanna talk about is, it should be, I, I'm assuming you're here, so it's probably obvious why I'm talking about this, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here, right? Over the past, particularly the past two or three years, nicotine vaping, historic rises in nicotine vaping, so, from two years ago to one year ago, so in that window from about 2017 to 2018, nationally, we've, we saw historic rises that we've never seen before in nicotine vaping. And now we're seeing coming in behind that from 2018 to 19, we're seeing historic rises in marijuana vaping among young people, right? So when I talk about a one-two punch, this is what we're seeing is the one-two punch in nicotine and marijuana in vaping form. Now in the past six months, I'm sure you've seen this in the news, right? where all of a sudden people are dying from this. And you're probably like, what? Because we only, most of us know, or all of us know, e-cigarettes have been around for a decade or more, right? So you've probably wondered why are people all of a sudden dying from this? So I'll, I'll get into some of that. Uh, you probably have heard some of the news stories in terms of why that might be, so I'll dig into some of that as well. One of my biggest concerns when I talk about low-risk messaging, you might say, Matt, what are you talking about, low-risk messaging? I don't know what that means. Think about the word recreation, just that term in and of itself. And I want you to shout it up. You know, I've been doing this for this presentation since the fall. And when I ask this question, I almost get the same one or two words, right? So let's do some Freud without the couch, you know? <laughs> nobody, nobody does the couch, by the way, no, anymore. So without the couch, let's say, when I say recreation, first thing that comes to mind, recreation. Fun. Fun. Everybody said the same word. Everybody says the same word, okay? So we're tagging this drug, right, recreational. So the question of the day for you is, why is it not called retail marijuana? What's the messaging in that? What is recreation? Recreation is fun. Recreation is playing a sport, an instrument, right? Hanging out with friends, et cetera. I don't need to go on and on, right? We get what recreation is. So the messaging to young people, to me, and I don't think this is a stretch to say this, but this is, okay, so this is, this is a fun drug now, okay, but you have to be 21. Young people, you can't do this fun drug. Okay, really, we expect our teenage, you know, we all know how teenagers are, no offense to teenagers. I love working with you, okay, by the way. But the teenage brain is wired to push boundaries, right? That's otherwise, evolutionarily speaking, it wouldn't, teenagers would never leave, leave home, right? The teenage brain is wired to push boundaries, try new things, maybe do stupid things from time to time. So when we talk about a fun drug, right, all I'm doing is 
interchanging recreation and fun, okay? Can I do that, is that fair? Okay, I know it's me a little dramatic, but it, it's to make a point. So when we talk about a, fr a fun drug, but you can't do it, what's the messaging there? What's the messaging if a young person can get it? I mean, there's certainly gonna be young people that are law-abiding teenagers, right? But are we gonna count strictly on the law being the thing that's gonna prevent young people from doing this when we're basically tagging fun along with this? So why not retail? It bothers me. Why, it's, if we're gonna call, do you ever, how many times have you heard the term recreational alcohol? Have you ever heard that, right? So just like with vaping and vapor and the term vapor and humidifiers, which I'll get into, be aware of the messaging that's flying right under your radar, right? That's, this is, these are industries, you know, like with, with alcohol, right? The, all the advertising, the commercials, right? We have the Super Bowl coming up. I know there's some folks old enough in the room here. Do you remember the, bu the Bud Bowl where like the, 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 the bottles would like play football against each other, which if you think about it is a really weird idea. I know there's some young people out there that are like, who, who is this guy talking about Bud Bowl? What, what is this, right? So, so the, the, this, is, this is an industry that wants to make money. This is an industry that's ready to make money, right? Marijuana industry, vaping industry are already kind of half, well down that road, right? So we have to be careful about this messaging. And so I see a large part of my role, and I would encourage you to do the same in whatever small way that you can, is to do your part to try to create accurate, to portray or, or proliferate accurate information about what this really is, because otherwise, what young people are hearing is it went from medicine, okay, medicine cure, right? Medicine's boring, fun, recreation. So not only is it maybe it's not that bad for me, now it's, this is fun, right? Can you see why I'm concerned about where this could head with young people? So that's, that's the last bullet point. That's the lane when I do these presentations a couple nights a week. That's really what I'm trying to get out there to more and more people is accurate information. And just making you aware of that. Did you guys think about that kind of recreation versus retail? You know, I didn't think about it until just a few months ago and it was really eye-opening to me. It's like, why? Oh, it's the industry. It's the industry, industry's kind of sneaky way to start to lure in younger and younger people without maybe the blatant, you know, if all of a sudden there was, there, on social media you heard about advertising for, you know, dad pens and, and all these different products, everybody would be up in arms, right? But nobody's up in arms about, at least that I'm seeing, well, some people are, but you don't hear people being up in arms about the fact that this is being called recreational marijuana, not retail marijuana, do you? Right, sneaky, right under the radar. Don't even notice it, right? So let's talk about marijuana first and then tr we'll transition into vaping. So for those of you, I'm in my 40s now, looking around, I see some people, fellow parents that are maybe in their 40s, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger, okay? What I wanna do is I wanna try to kind of reboot your view of what marijuana is. Because the marijuana now, particularly the past five years, has evolved so quickly and changed so much that it's really important to have a different perspective of what marijuana is now. Because if you think of marijuana in terms of some of the kind of the traditional stereotypes that this is my feeble attempt to try to recreate what some of those stereotypes are, right? So fill in your own stereotypes of what you think they might be, right? But the reality of it is, is that the world of marijuana much more so revolves around this than it does around this. That's not to say you don't see the plant material, you do, it's out there, it's for sale at the recreational shops where it's, where it's legally sold, right? But with younger people in particular, and when we talk about these deaths that we've, that we've seen over the past six months, this is, what, this is why young people are dying. That, this is what it looks like. It's not, it's not, it's not that, it's, it's this, black market products that look like that, cartridges, carts, dad pens, those types of things, okay? So, and then in the top left there, you have dabs, wax. These, these are products that are incredibly potent. When, I talk, when, it, when we talk about, and I'll get into CBD, I'll, we'll talk a little bit about edibles. But if you look at the potency of marijuana up until the mid-90s, it was about 4% THC, and THC, as most of you probably know at this point, just because of how kind of pervasive in our culture it is, THC is that psychoactive component that gets you high, okay? So up until the mid-90s, it was about 4%. We've blown past the 13% that you see here in 2016. 
to now it's on average between 20 and 25 percent. And now that we're talking about the plant material here, the flower. Okay, I'm going to take it. Unfortunately, I'm going to take it to a whole nother level. Okay, so you're on average talking about five times the marijuana being about five times. Sorry for my ADHD clicking back and forth. I apologize for that. Um, so you're talking about the plant material being about five times stronger than it was back even up until the mid-90s, okay? Number five. I'm just going to give you a few, few numbers to remember. So five for the plant material, okay? Now, these are increasingly common where we'll work with kids because one of my jobs is working for Rosecrans, kind of a larger substance abuse treatment provider in the area. And I remember a couple years ago doing assessments on teenagers that were using marijuana every day, every day, that had never seen that in person. And you might say, well, how is that possible? It's because so many of the products now are extracts, concentrates, oils, liquids, like what comes in these devices. This is what most, honestly, this is what most young people that use marijuana are using are products that look like this, okay? Now, when you talk about those types of products, the average goes up even more. So these, on the left, it's kind of irrelevant, the, just the names of some of the, the products that uh, the, the dab pens and, and cartridges. But if you just eyeball it, you would say the average would be about, what, 35%? Is that fair? So that's about nine times stronger than that plant material back in the early to mid-90s. So five times stronger now for the plant material, nine times stronger for these cartridges, these pens, right? And this is what we see more often than the plant material. And this is just averages. That 35% is not strong, that is not strong by the standards of what young people are doing if they're using marijuana now, okay? So let's do the quick math. So we said nine, right? So when I get a call from, once a week I get a call from a nurse at one of the local high schools, a social worker or dean, and they say, Matt, th there's no way what this kid did could have been marijuana. And I say to them, I do like a little one minute kind of tutorial of what we just talked about. And I say it very well might have been, because if you think about, let's say, in the parking lot or in the bath, whatever, where they had access to it, let's say they took three puffs of it. Nine times three, that's 27 puffs or hits of early to mid-90s marijuana, 27. So when you talk about the more significant effects that we're seeing that I'm getting calls about all the time from schools, where they have to send kids to the ER, right? Sometimes kids end up having to stay in the inpatient psych units because of psychotic episodes, right? When you think about 27 hits, is it any wonder that we're talking about crossing into a whole new zone of, especially for maybe younger people that don't have, that are, maybe aren't as used to it or don't have that tolerance, right? that don't realize these devices are tiny. They look like little, sometimes they look like little metal cigarettes, right? So it could be so easy, and it's, it could be so easy to say, well, that can't be that bad. All of a sudden, you're in the ER, and we see it more and more, right? So now, hopefully, you understand why I showed you those two slides. I show you the tie-dye, right? Please realize, as a parent, and I bring that up because I think sometimes parents nowadays, they remember kind of that, that weed that their friend did, right? That maybe made them, hung, all these stereotypes, the munchies and the red eye, right? But you have, it's really important to realize as parents now, and even for young people, how much more potent it is, okay? Because when you combine the potency going way up with the perception of harm going way down, and is it any wonder when we tag recreation to the drug, what do we expect? What do we expect our young people are gonna perceive with a drug that's being tagged as recreational? You know, yeah, for adults, okay, sure. It's fun, fun drug, right? So this is what we've seen over the past 20 plus years is it, I kind of call it like the evil crisscross where the potency is going way up, but the perception of harm is going way down. So you have young people that are much more willing to try this because them and their peers perceive it as being something that's not that big a deal, but something that they're much more vulnerable to in terms of some of those more severe. And not only that, when we get into brain development and risk for addiction, when you talk about, it's not rocket science, think about this. If, some, if a young person starts using right off the bat a more potent marijuana product, are they more or less likely to get hooked 
onto it in those, proceed, in, in those following couple years if it's really strong versus if it's not. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out, right? And that's what I'm concerned about, is the fact that it's getting more potent but perceived as less harmful. That's, that's what I worry about over the next X number of years is, is the impact that that's going to have on young people that do it. So I always talk about the two pillars I've identified them as. The two pillars of why it's so important, in my mind, that parents really try as much as possible to parent behind the message of non-use. The first, the first being the idea of the younger you start something, any drug, nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, the more susceptible you are to developing a more severe substance use issue later on in life. Nine out of 10 times when you talk about alcoholism, you talk about heroin addiction, 92% of people that are addicted to heroin out there, when they, do a, when they do a survey of where they started, it's almost always in that 13 to 16 year old age range with marijuana, maybe alcohol, right? 92% of the time. In other words, addiction almost always starts before the, at the age of 18. And so you'll hear me come back to this time and time again. So dangerous in my mind, the messaging of recreation when, you're, when, you're, when, when young people hear, are hearing that and that, that 12 to 18 year old age range is so vulnerable to progressing into it, right? Because they're not, and this is why I love getting this information to people, they're, they're oftentimes, younger, young people aren't, they're hearing plenty of that, <coughs> that subliminal messaging about fun, but unfortunately I don't think they're getting, they're, I don't think they're getting hammered as much with the message about this stuff that I'm talking about. And that's why I love playing my little role in trying to get this information out there because we need counterbalancing with this. If we're gonna talk about now a legal recreational drug, if we're not counterbalancing this with information about risk with young people, we're in trouble. Trust me, we are in trouble. We need to counterbalance it with this information. It's really, really important. Now, I know the term gateway drug gets thrown around a lot. You even hear it sometimes get thrown into political debates. I've heard it get thrown into the political debates. I'm actually not a fan of the term. Like people will ask, well, Matt, is, is marijuana a gateway drug? Maybe. Well, how satisfying an answer is that, right? I don't like it because it want, it, it wants, gateway wants to be so black and white. That term like leans toward like, I want a yes or no answer to that question. And you just can't give a yes or no answer because it's all about risk factors. So let me give you a couple examples. One, if you have a, a 13 or 14 year old that has a family history of substance abuse, alcoholism, addiction, that also has uh, maybe specific mental health issues, ADHD, anxiety, depression, maybe some abuse in their, or their childhood that starts using marijuana at 14, is that marijuana gonna be a gateway drug? Unfortunately, probably, there's a very good chance, right? But then you take a, let's say a 30 year old, no family history um, of substance abuse, no mental health issues, no trauma, and they decide at 30, they're gonna join a wine club. Are they gonna become an alcoholic? Probably not, right? So you, ha you have to consider those very important details or those risk factors versus something just being blanket a gateway drug or not, makes sense? So risk factors in my mind is a much better evaluation of, of a drug becoming a bigger issue or turning into other, other things versus just the, the, the term gateway drug. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on the law because quite honestly, the law bores me. My, my niece was in a law school and she showed me the books that she reads. She's like, I love it and I read it. I, I get about a half sentence in, I'm out. I, can't, I just can't even, it won't even go in, it won't even go in my brain. Okay, so this is gonna be my law slide. So sorry if you were expecting like a lot of good drilled down detail about the marijuana law in Illinois. I apologize in advance if that's what you were expecting. But that's not my lane. So I'm not gonna talk out of, out of, my, out of my lane, right? So, and most of this you probably know already too. So I'm but I said in the title, the law. So I, I feel like I'd be misleading if I didn't have at least one slide on the law, okay? So adults 21 and older can purchase it. But again, I think I've made it pretty clear, don't be naive in thinking, well, okay, now it's like alcohol, it's like tobacco, 21 and older, young people won't be doing it. La-di-da, right? Naive, right? Can we all agree on that, please, because of the messaging? That's not to say that 16-year-olds are gonna be going into these shops, and but no, I don't think they are. I think most of them now and in for the foreseeable future are gonna be very vigilant about IDing and all of those things. 
my main concern is a couple things. One is, is the, you know, the obvious, the cool older brother, older sister, cool, you know, aunt, uncle, sometimes parent, right? That wants to be liked, right? And doesn't maybe recognize all these risks that come along with buying their niece or nephew or little brother or little sister marijuana, right? The other is just availability. It's gonna be just out there more. It's gonna be in more homes, right? Because you're gonna have more adults doing it. They're not, adults aren't gonna be locking it up. They're gonna be putting it in drawers. It's gonna be, you know, and, and teenagers are masters at being able to find things, right? We all know this. So it's just gonna be out there more. It's gonna be more accessible in homes. 80% of the time when young people start drinking, they get the alcohol either from their own home or from a close friend's house. They're not, they're not buying, buying alcohol from liquor stores, right? So that's what I'm worried is gonna happen with, with marijuana as well. It's just gonna be out there more. And there's gonna be more accessibility to it because of that. The potency, the tax rate, in terms of the more potent it is, the, more, the higher tax rate. There is, this is the one where I always get either eye rolls or people putting their head down and shaking their head. So there is no cap on potency in Illinois, just FYI. Sometimes I get big eyes. That's another one that I'll get, right? So this is where I have to be careful not to get on more of a political and, and, and legal soapbox, so I won't do it. But no cap on potency in Illinois, OK? So you're going to see these high potency, like that stuff that looked like wax, that like yellow wax that was up in the left corner. You're going to see products like that. You're going to see the 35% dab pens, cartridges, 20 to 25% of the plant material. Really, you're not going to see much at all of anything that's under 20% THC, really. I mean, the only thing you will see is stuff that has like CBD blends, those types of things. But generally speaking, you're not going to see anything that's anywhere near the ballpark of what you saw in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s in terms of potency. OK, I want to do a transition here. Oh, I'm pretty good. OK. Um, into more kind of talking about vaping in and of itself. Now, remember we talked about recreation and fun. This is another audience participation portion of the, of the uh, presentation. So on the left, you have a humidifier. On the right, you have a can of aerosol spray, OK? Now, don't think about these devices, Juul, and all of these. OK, so quick show of hands. When you hear the word vapor, just the word vapor, who thinks of the humidifier on the left? Raise your hand. Okay, who thinks of the aerosol can on the right? Okay, now most people like what just happened there, probably 80%, and don't feel bad, because actually you're right, by the way, when you talk about vaping. Um, but most people, when they hear the word vapor, probably 80% of the time, they associate with the left, humidifier, air, steam, right? And vapor and vaping, noun, verb, right? So. When the term changed from e-cigarettes to vapes or vaping three years ago-ish, four years ago maybe, is when I first started hearing about Juul, those devices. When that terminology changed, is it any wonder that it started to skyrocket amongst youth when we're associating something that's an aerosol, because chemically, actually what's being inhaled is an aerosol. It's much more like what's on the right. But when you use the word vapor, when you were use the word vapor, and then you attack flavors like mint and mango and strawberry and cherry, seven thousand flavors. I could go on and on. Every sugar cereal you've ever heard of in your life, there's a, a flavor for for e-liquids or or e-juices along with that. But again, just like the the messaging around recreational marijuana, when you have a young person that you hear about the flavor, right, mint, mango, and then you hear the word vapor, what do you th what would you think? I know I'd think the same thing all of you thought. So when you have young people, you know, two, three, four years ago, I think younger people are getting wiser to this now. But think three, four years ago when you hear something and it's immediately associated with humidifier air, flavored humidifier air, does that sound that bad? No. But when you really break it down in terms of what young people have been inhaling over these past three or four years, it's a whole different story, even though in the liquid itself, there's oftentimes not a lot of ingredients in the liquid. But to me, what's in the liquid is irrelevant, really, because you're not ingesting the liquid. What you're doing is you are inhaling the aerosol. This is kind of my shock and awe, so I apologize if this seems a little dramatic. But when you talk about formaldehyde, you talk about cadmium, you talk about paint stripper, and you talk about antifreeze, 
I always forget the formal name, so I have to go to the next slide. Diethylene glycol, acid aldehyde. Now that's not to say in these devices, every device has all of these chemicals, but every single one of these chemicals has been found in some combination in these, particularly these jewels and other nicotine vaping devices that now have been sold for three, four, five years, right? So can you imagine a human, can you imagine when you, you know, had little kids or, you know, when you, younger people here, when you had that, the cold, like what I'm getting over now, and putting, putting that humidifier on in the room, and this is what you're cranking out? Wouldn't be a very good parent, right? But that's, the, again, again, the sneaky, that subtle stealth messaging, vaping. Doesn't sound bad, right? And so it's invited, you know, three or four years ago, Juul, they were, they were using, behind the scenes, they were also using pretty blatant social media marketing and advertising with the traditional uh, cigarette playbook with young, young people having fun, all of that stuff, right? So that, that helped fuel it, fuel it as well. And they've, of course, had to kind of change their tune and change their messaging around that. But when you combine that with the, the devices which look like the, the flash drive that I brought this presentation on, almost like this, very sleek, easy to hide, stealth. There's just been this perfect storm, very small little, almost undetectable puff of, of aerosol. I always try to call it aerosol and not vapor, right? Because then, then I'm kind of not practicing what I preach in terms of using accurate terminology. But what's interesting is the, the chemicals in yellow there, those are also in cigarettes. So when I ask young people in doing evaluations, I say, do you smoke cigarettes? I usually, I usually love the reaction that I get from most kids, which is, no, no way. Like, you know, my grandfather died of emphysema because of cigarettes, or my aunt smoked, and I thought it smelled gross, blah, 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 right? But then I'll follow that up with, do you vape? And then I get the response I don't like as much. Oh, yeah, every day. I don't, why are you even asking me, right? Because there's a huge disconnect. I think it's, the disconnect isn't what it was a year ago. I think it's gotten better because of all the news that's been paid to this over the past six months. But there's still, even with all of the news, trust me, I talked to enough young people, that that, that that idea of it being relatively harmless vapor, yeah, they know it's nicotine, maybe marijuana, but there's still this really strong-rooted perception that it's not that big a deal, right? Even though there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Unfortunately, this is the slide that I've had to update regularly, if not once a week, sometimes more than that. Fortunately, it's leveled off over the past month or two, which tells me that a lot of the black market marijuana products that have been driving a lot of this, about 80% of it, have been getting pulled um, or younger, and, and or younger people that use these black market marijuana products, I think, are getting wiser to not using them because they don't want to die, right? It's amazing, the survival instinct when it kicks in, right? Now, there's a couple prime suspects in this in terms of why are people dying, why the significant lung injury. A lot of it is because when these black market marijuana products are created, it's still, they're still, it's still grown marijuana, and they're using pesticides and fungicides so that there's, for obvious reasons, right, so that the crop doesn't get destroyed. But what's happening is when they use those chemicals, and then they, they do the extraction process to get the oils and concentrates in those things, that some of those fungicides and pesticides are getting kind of brought along for the ride, right? And so they see elevated, sometimes five to 10 times higher levels of what should be kind of a bare minimum level are in some of these devices that have this marijuana liquid. The other one that's really common is this vitamin E acetate, which is kind of a filler that makes the liquid more, it creates a kind of a thicker, a thicker puff of aerosol, which for young people makes it look like a better product. So it's, it's in the black market, it's been commonly used as a filler, but it's an oil-based product. So if you could imagine taking a can of whatever, you know, PAM, like the nonstick spray that you'd use to, before you make eggs or whatever, and inhaling that. Obviously, that's an, I'm, being, I'm exaggerating a little bit with that, but when you talk about inhaling an oil-based solvent, again, we don't, all of us, including myself, we don't need to be rocket scientists to understand what inhaling an oil-based solvent could do to our lungs. Now, the irony in that is that vitamin E acetate is actually, it's commonly used in skin creams, sometimes in food additives, but when you have your skin as its own protective layer, or in your stomach, you have all those stomach acids, your lungs are so much more like tissue paper, so much more vulnerable than those other two organs because it doesn't have that shield of acids or just a, just a, a, this, a thicker barrier there. 
And then the irony other part is, the other suspect in this is a lot of times the flavoring agents. Because you'll hear young people say, well, I, I like to do it for the flavor. But like, let's take mango flavor, for instance, which has one, been one of the most common jewel flavors. We, I, I hope we all know that they don't take mangoes and they like, squeeze the juice out of it into the, right? We all know this, I hope, right? They take sometimes a cocktail of four, six, 10, 15 different chemicals that are flavoring agents that they combine in different ways to get the flavor that they want. And what they're finding is like, uh, hopefully, oh there, here we go. Like diacetyl, for the first few years that we saw these vaping devices, they're, fortunately they're phasing it out because of this idea of popcorn lung. Now, popcorn lung is, is a slang term for something called bron bronchiolitis obliterans, it's a medical term. Does that sound okay? Bronchiolitis obliterans? Let's free association, obliterans, what word comes to mind? Obli obliterate, right? Obliterate doesn't sound good, right? So this, is, this has been a, a, a flavoring agent in microwave popcorn, but again, stomach acid safe, right? But when you talk about this flavoring agent being inhaled, there's a whole story behind it. A doctor in Missouri all, that worked near a microwave popcorn factory, these workers were inhaling it as they were making their microwave popcorn and developing really severe, sometimes severe lung diseases to the point where they needed lung transplants, right? So the idea of flavoring agents being safe isn't, you can't assume that either. That's a suspect in all this as well. But there's no one smoking gun. It's mostly these few things I've mentioned in terms of what are the prime suspects and why we're seeing such significant issues with vaping going on. This is somebody that's kind of quickly becoming my hero. His name is Chance Amarada, lives down in Florida. He's an 18 year old. And about six months ago, he ended up in the hospital in the ICU with a collapsed lung and a, hole, and a hole in his lungs. No marijuana use, no marijuana vaping, no marijuana smoking, all just Juul, right? This very commonly used vape, nicotine vaping device. He admitted heavily over the past couple of years using it. But he's really, because this happened to him, he's taken on this crusade, and I admire him for it because someone like him I think could really, through social media and through all the advocacy that he's doing, could really make a change more so than anybody else because he's still young. He's still connected to young people. He's spoken on Capitol Hill. He's spoken at numerous, numerous schools. He has his own podcast. He has his own foundation, Lung Love Foundation. He's just, he's just grabbed this bull by the horns because I think like a lot of people in the kind of 17 to 21, 22 year old age range now, what I like that what I like that I'm starting to see is a lot of them are getting really angry. They're really get, they're getting really angry at this industry because they feel like they've been they've been duped and they've been misled. And I agree with them. When you talk about mint flavored vapor, mint flavored humidifier air, I would feel misled too because that doesn't sound that bad, does it? Again, no, right? So I, I do see, especially with some of those upper class high school early, where there does seem to be kind of a social media growing movement. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's growing little by little in terms of the, the, the effect of it. So you can't see it as well because of the lights up here, but you'll have to just take my word that this is a lung scan where there's a whole bunch of black dots that were starting to form on his lungs from all those chemicals that he was ingesting that again, most young people have no awareness of all the chemicals that they're ingesting when they use these devices. Sorry for the profanity there. I didn't want to. I didn't want to change his message because sometimes that has a, a strong strong impact. More and more studies emerging about how scary effective these devices are in terms of how efficient of nicotine delivery systems they are. Extracted nicotine salts from the tobacco plant. Look at, the, look at how much higher the nicotine levels are in urine versus tobacco or versus cigarettes. Look how quickly young people are getting addicted to these devices relative to cigarettes. It almost makes it, looks like, it almost makes it look like with cigarettes, you have to really try to get addicted relative to these Juul and other nicotine vaping devices. And relatively speaking, that's true, right? the percentage of kids that keep using them versus cigarettes. And then I just pulled this quote because I'm hearing more and more quotes like this. Uh, the idea of, I, just like with Chance, this is a Chance, this is somebody else. I had no idea. I had no idea how addictive these things were gonna be. I had no idea how much it would impact my personality, how much it would impact my functioning, right? 
And so this is information that's important to get out, particularly in my mind, to middle schoolers. Because really, the ideal audience, in a lot of ways, for a lot of this information are parents of and middle schoolers who haven't tried doing this stuff. Because I'd like to think that given that counterbalancing again of some of this information, if you have young people that are maybe on the fence, should I try it? Is it humidifier air? Is it maybe not that big a deal? That given some of this information, I'd like to think some of them will come back down off the fence and say, well, you know what? I don't want little black dots in my lungs. I'm good. I'll go, I'll go back to eating candy a lot, right? So I talked about the one pillar being the risk for progression. The other really important part of this is brain development, and I don't think it gets the, the, the attention that it's due. When you talk about all of these different parts of the brain, that whether you're talking about nicotine, marijuana, alcohol, all of these kind of drugs of entry, as I call them, have particularly damaging effects on the teen brain relative to an adult because those are critical years in terms of the brain, but it, it could be easy to, because the brain doesn't stop growing outward past about age 13 or 14, right? But up until age 25, 30 sometimes, inside there's still a lot of growth of really small, important parts of the brain, amygdala, and nucleus accumbens, all these things, and there's a lot of pruning, rewiring. Sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of my water here, getting over a cold. And naturally, you would expect that it ties in very closely with that risk for progression, right? Why, why would there be an increase for a more, uh, the chance of a more significant substance use issue in teenagers? Well, here's why. It's because use of those drugs throws off the neurochemistry, and it even in some cases it throws off the actual physical development. These are actual you know, pea-sized, almond-shaped. These are actual physical bodies in the brain that are getting affected, the development of those physical parts of the brain are getting affected by use of these drugs. And so it really, it shouldn't be any wonder that we see that more susceptibility to a progressed problem. What really fascinated me when I first started reading more and more of this research that started coming out about four or five years ago is that when they talked about the parts of the brain that were most impacted apparently by marijuana use, and then you overlap it with the functions of those parts of the brain, like for instance, the amygdala, nu nucleus accumbens, hippocampus, the, the function of those parts of the brain matched, matched perfectly at that point, I was about 10 years into working with teens, at probably 80% of those, those teens that I worked with, marijuana was their drug of choice, and I would see the same symptoms over and over, and I still do, over and over and over again. Take a wild guess what I would see, lack of motivation, memory problems, mood dysregulation, right? Trouble managing anxiety, right? So I think part of, as professionals, it's really important. And sometimes I would love to say all my fellow professionals are really good at this, but sometimes with teenagers that are using marijuana regularly, they get straight up mi misdiagnosed as having an anxiety disorder. They may have underlying anxiety, but oftentimes the symptoms of the drug use, particularly if it's become habitual, can mimic depression can mimic an anxiety disorder, can mimic other things. And then if you pile on what's, if that's the case, then you pile on medications that maybe aren't appropriate for what's really going on, then all of a sudden it just gets messy, doesn't it, right? And so it's really important that we look at the effects that these drugs have on brain function, brain development, because that's what I've seen. Shouldn't be any surprise then when we talk about brain development, all these other things that study after study after study after study show that teenagers that use marijuana have a much higher rate of these types of functional impact into their adulthood and on through adulthood, right? So I do want to talk for a minute or two about CBD. Now this is my, because it might seem up until now I've, I've given it my best shot to try to demonize marijuana, and that's not really what I'm going for here. This is my attempt to create some nuance in this discussion because I think CBD, I think, has really, really high potential as a medicine. I really believe that. There's even FDA-approved medications out there already that you may not know, might not know about. 
And this is why I think it's so important to have kind of a, a two-lane perspective on this issue, for me at least. You guys can take or leave whatever you want. But I think it's important to have the lane of THC getting high, young people, and then the lane of CBD, adults in particular, medicinal value. Because they're, very, in my mind, they're almost completely distinct in terms of what I've read in terms of some of the research that's emerging with CBD and its ability to stimulate anandamide, which is the, the brain and body's own kind of dimmer switch. So what it can really do is it can help to kind of quiet. That's what it does with uh, childhood epilepsy, this a medication called Epidiolex. It kind of quiets that overactive electric, electrical activity and, and can sometimes completely eliminate childhood seizures. What a gift, right? And CBD is the, is the primary ingredient in that medication. There's other evidence that might be effective for other uh, inflammatory diseases, pain disorders, um, gastrointestinal issues, IBS, Crohn's, et cetera, et cetera, where, where that kind of dimming effect, where, something, where some part of the brain is just a little bit hyperactive in a way, that it can kind of dim that, okay? So I want to acknowledge that. It's important, I think, to acknowledge that. Because over the next 10 plus years, 20 years, I think you're going to see a number of CBD-based medications that come out that are FDA approved, clinical trials, double blind, all of the proper channels that end up coming out. The problem though is that this industry is a multi-billion dollar industry that's making a lot of money. And so that industry is not waiting for the research, right? They're jumping right ahead, putting it in doggy treats, right? And if you think they've done the clinical trials with you know, video cameras with dogs in homes and how many, Okay, how many shoes have they eaten or how many times have they, right? There's, there's a lot of claims about what CBD could be good for, but we're, I think we're, we're ahead of ourselves in terms of where the research is with it versus what the claims are. That's not to say some of the things that they're claiming that it could be helpful for won't proven later on to be helpful, but we're not quite there yet, right? So in that way, I would say buyer beware. And there isn't very good regulation over this industry yet where oftentimes the level of CBD is higher or lower than what's claimed, or there still could be THC in, in the product because it's hard to extract 100% CBD without there still being THC components in it. So just, I would say, very hopeful, but buyer beware, just realize that research is still pretty limited at this point in terms of how far along it's gotten. But there's, there's promising stuff going on in terms of the research behind it. So I do want to acknowledge that. So I want to spend the last few minutes before we wrap up here. We'll try to get you guys at least to Q&A by 8 o'clock, get you out here close to 8 o'clock, because I know that's kind of the time frame we promised for you. But I do want to give you some what I consider to be, like I said, my oldest is 11. I always kind of joke that let me do this presentation in 10 years, and I'll probably have a much better perspective on what it's like to go through all of this with teenagers. But I have done 1,001 parent meetings plenty of family meetings, right, where I've been able to kind of see modifications that parents have made that do tend to help, and modifications that parents make, or, or, or modifications they don't make that don't help, right? So I wanna share some of that, also combined with just some of the research that I've read that overlaps with those two things. So I always like to start from a strength-based approach, okay? A, a lot of, in my mind, what will potentially protect young people from using these things from a parenting perspective are tie in closely what, with what you probably consider to be good parenting anyway, right? In terms of the idea being where you're trying to create a young person that is content with, and, and no, I understand no teenager is fully self-secure and super, right? I get that. But what you're really shooting for is this idea of I'm, I'm okay with who I am. I like who I am. I can, I can talk to people. I want to be authentic. I'm good with how I, who I am, right? Because I don't know if anybody here knows who Chris Heron is. He comes to town every once in a while, and he does a great job of presenting his story. Has anybody heard him talk? One of the things he mentions that always strikes me is that when he reflects back on the high school and the basements and the red solo cups and the beer pong and all of that stuff, he relates that Deep down, really at the time, what he was is he was jealous. He was jealous of the young kids that would maybe have, you know, they'd have soda in their, or water in their red solo cup. And we're okay with that. 
and were able to talk and be comfortable in their own skin because he never felt like he could be that way, right? And that's not easy as a parent to just hand to your kid, right? Is that self-assuredness, that confidence. But you want to try to do everything that you can to nurture that and, and invite that and build that confidence, that authenticity, that resilience. And I just put up there, one thing in particular, Dr. Kenneth Ginsburg has a book about the seven C's of resilience. Because we could go off and there's, there's speakers in the Adam Russo out in Edgewood, Edgewood Clinical Services, anybody's heard him talk. There's speakers, speakers in there that focus strictly on the gift of failure and resilience and those types of things. So this could be a whole other hour presentation, right? But ideally, you want them to make that right decision for themselves, right? That's, gosh, that's what I'm hoping for, you know, with my kids is where, you know, maybe a little bit of a brainwashing where my 11-year-old rose her eyes at me. Yeah, Dad, I know my brain's not developed until I'm 25. I get it, blah, 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 right? I don't know, maybe that's gonna backfire on me, but I'm going with that plan. It's, it's just that subtle brainwash. I don't know how it's gonna play out. Like I said, let's check back in 10 years and I'll let you know. My oldest is the rule, it's my four-year-old Shawnee. He's the, he's the wild child. He's the one that I think I have to worry about. Listen more than you talk. I know this isn't easy, because I think as parents, I think we just wanna just always just keep sharing our infinite wisdom, right? I heard somebody say this, you know, a while back, and I kind of, the more I think about it, the more I agree, that really, by the time your kids go into high school, they pretty much know what you think of the world, right? That's not to say that you shouldn't have boundaries and expectations and consequences and rules, right? But in terms of just this kind of bombarding with, with wisdom and, inf right, I would say you want to kind of peel back on that, because they know pretty much how you feel about the world at that point, and I agree with that. You want to shift more into, okay, here are the guardrails. Here are the rules, here are the, right? You drive within that, but here are the guardrails. Now let, let me listen, what's, what's it like? You know, how is it to be a teenager? Get, try to walk a mile in their shoes, try to empathize, because the reality of it is, is if your teenager feels like you occasionally, it's never gonna be 100%, we all know that, but if they occasionally feel like you get where they're coming from, and that you hear them, that's gonna keep the threads of that relationship together, right? And when we talk about I'll come back to that. We talk about one of the biggest deterrents to using, it's even though that teenagers will act like they never want to talk to their parents, they want to have nothing to do with them. That's why I always joke with that previous slide, you know, talk 25%, listen. All the parents come up to me and say, okay, Matt, well, what's 25% of zero? How am I, so I don't, so I can't talk at all then, basically, is what you're saying, right? Um, but if you keep, if you, if you keep the threads of that relationship there, they don't want to let you down. They don't want to lose that trust. They don't want to disappoint you, right? But how are they going to know if they're going to disappoint you? How are they going to know if they start to lose that trust? Is if, if at least they have some sense about what your, what your boundaries are, right? That's not meant to be like, you better not, you'll, you'll, you'll never leave the house if I catch you, right? That doesn't work with teenagers well. We know that. Come from more a perspective of love, care, concern, potential, thriving, right? Because what we're really talking about here is setting a young person up as a parent for the best chance of success as an adult, right? By, by young people not using drugs, or at least delaying, let's say, having a beer or a glass of wine until they're 21, or apparently now marijuana, right? That you're, you're setting them up for the best chance of success because of brain development and all these other risk factors, right? So you want to come at it from that perspective and, and not threats and that doesn't work well, right? Be careful with the printing out the articles every day and putting them on the bed, on the dresser, right? They'll, 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 what they'll do is they'll read none of it, <laughs> just FYI, and then they'll, you know, oh yeah, I'm sure. I'll, so just realize that I know, you, try to have it be in conversation. That's where you want to mix in this stuff. They're not going to, oh, articles. They read enough at school. They don't want to read more, okay? Mix it, weave it in, you know, stuff that you've liked from this presentation. Weave it in, in those rare moments where they are talking to you. Try to weave it into the conversation where you're like, oh, right here I can, but just a little bit. Don't go on for 20 minutes, you know. Oh, by the way, I saw this, you know, this, you know, presentation and blah, blah, blah. No, no, just little, little cheeseburgers, right? Little tiny little bites, okay? And I just put examples of some of what I consider be like the key, key elements from this presentation that you can grab and, and utilize. The do's and don'ts, 
Yelling, screaming, shaming, all that does generally is gonna feed kind of that, what I call the black sheep syndrome, right? And that's what, you know, with all the adults I work with that are in recovery, that struggle, almost always it's a shame-based, it's a guilt-based disease, right? So you gotta be careful. Sometimes a little bit of guilt can help, but if it starts to turn into shame, where there I'm a bad person, that's, that's the, a dangerous road where you're heading them down. The I, lower self-esteem, maybe I am a bad person, depression, all of those things can actually fuel the problem, right? You wanna, you wanna stay calm and the, really the, this is the empathy part, is try to figure out the why. Try to really get in their shoes and say why did, try to figure out why they did that. Try to understand it and not just attack it. Understand what happened. Well, just let me understand it, tell me, right? But be careful with that because like as a counselor, as a therapist, one of our main roles is to empathize really well. I've worked with young people where early on in my career, I made the mistake I met with the teenager and I was really empathizing, you know, why they relapsed, why they used marijuana. And they walk out and the parent comes in the next time and they're like, Matt, Johnny said that like you thought it was okay. What he, right? So you have to bookend it with the idea of, okay, I get it. But please understand as a parent, we have to have these guardrails. We have to have these expectations for you because we don't want this to turn into something larger or we don't want you to not reach your potential, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you wanna make sure to bookend it, not do too good of a job of empathizing in that situation. Communicating expectations, having clear boundaries, having clear consequences. Be careful, please don't fall into the rite of passage, right? I think we all as parents wanna do a little bit better job than previous generations of parenting, right? So all this research that I've shared with you, what would you say the research is driving toward in terms of parenting a young person around substances? All the research, all the brain development, brain scans, it points toward non-use or at the very worst, delay, at the very least delay, right? That's what the research says. So, so parenting from a rite of passage, well, teenagers will drink, teenagers will try things, right? That's dangerous. And to me, it's, it's in some ways antiquated if you're really looking at the research. So just consider that. At least it's only, if you're saying at least it's only, be careful. You could be walking down that path to a bigger problem. You could be walking down your own path of denial if you're saying at least it's only. At least it's not this bad. It could be worse. Just be careful if you find yourself saying that to yourself. Seek out help. If it's getting above your head, you're trying to take the phone, you're grounding, you're doing all of these things. If it's getting to that point, there very well might be an underlying issue. There might be real underlying anxiety, depression that's developing, ADHD. Seek out a professional. You know, that's where you know, Rosecrans, myself in practice, happy to consult, try to link you up with services, link you up with therapists in the area, right? Um, people that can help, people that are trained in this, right? So please realize when this develops, it's not always a kid trying to be trouble. Sometimes it means it's, it's a red flag that there's something else going on. Some, I, I'm grasping for straws here. I'm trying to get by. I don't know what's going on. I need help. Please realize that that could be the sign that's being given off if this gets worse. So last slide here, and then we'll finish up. We're pretty close to, to being right on time. Now, all the strength-based, all of the empathy, all the listening, all of that is great. Try all that first, please. But sometimes if, if you do all that and it's just continuing to get worse, I've worked with parents that be the heavy, they, they put on that probation officer hat, and that's the thing that, cha that changes things. Every kid is different. Some kids aren't gonna respond as well to this. That's why I say use this as more of a last resort. But if you see the problem getting worse, you see in your gut and what you see visual, you're, you're finding it, it's getting worse. I always tell parents, to me, drug tests can be a great deterrent. In my mind, ideally, they're a deterrent. I've already, in my mind, thought of this scenario where I could see one of my kids at a social event, somebody's house at a party, and they're saying to their friend, my dad is nuts. He, he has his own breathalyzer. My dad is nuts. He has this home drug testing kit he bought and he planted it down on the, on the counter. The guy is crazy, right? So, so I, can't, I, I can't do it. I don't, I'll be the crazy parent. Don't be afraid to be that parent because I think nowadays it could be a little easier to avoid that role but sometimes you have to be, you have to play that role at times where other, where the strength base, the love base, the caring, where all of those things maybe aren't steering it in a different direction. Set a good example, if you drink, drink moderately, drink smart, don't make it clear that you're self-medicating your bad day by tr drinking a whole bunch. 
your own history, what I would say is, I'd love to tell you if you had adventures when you were younger. What I would say is, it's dangerous to relate the details of all that, just saying, well, I'll do this, all this other stuff. I just want to be open and honest and everything will turn out okay. My experience has been that when young people hear those stories, they think what? They think, you did it, you turned out okay. No matter how, how great you come across with the, with the details of it, you know, don't, do, don't learn from my mistakes, don't do what I did. I would just be careful because they might misinterpret it to say, well, you did it, you turned out okay, so I'll do it, I'll turn out okay. Just focus much more so on your, your house rules, your own rules, parent rules, research, all of those things, and keep it focused on that. And now I'm not telling you to lie, but I'm just saying, don't, I wouldn't dive too much into that because they might misinterpret that. That's just what I've seen. I, I would love to tell you otherwise. That's just not what I've seen. Okay, so just sources that I've pulled a lot of this information from. Like I said, I'd be happy to. I think it's going to be up. Um, is one of you going to mention? Is it going to be up on the website somewhere or it's going to be uh, available? Okay. 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 So this is just information, contact information through my practice. I have my Rosecrans card. Rose, we have free confidential assessments and treatment services for teens all throughout Chicagoland and out in Rockford. So thank you very, very much. I, I'd be happy to answer questions you guys might have. I want to be mindful of people that were a little bit more strict to an 8 o'clock time frame. I know I've gone a few minutes over, so I apologize for that. But I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. If you have more personal questions, usually I get a couple of those at events like this too. I'm happy to answer those if you want to come up after we're, we're all done. But thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So we have time for a Q&A session. Obviously, we can ask Matt whatever we'd like. We also have the SROs from York here, Tim and Nick. Uh, and they can talk if you have questions about you know, the schools or if your child gets caught or anything of the sort. Um, we also have Danny Polemski here, who is an elder woman on the city council. Any questions about the recent um, ordinances that were passed and so forth in Elmhurst? So whatever you guys have, don't be shy, please. Yes. Who's it for? Yeah, go ahead. I'd love to, yeah. How, how do we go about suggesting that? Uh, I, would, I would say go to the administration at the school, and it's certainly just that's usually the best thing to do is get them in contact with me and arranging it that way. But that's, that's been kind of my new passion and my new branch of what I'm doing more is, I, I, don't get me wrong, I love doing these, right? But I've started to, I've started to realize, wait a minute, I want to get this, in, and some of, I filter some of it out. I don't think... Teen, like middle schoolers need to know it maybe as much about the potency, or at least I don't need to get in the weeds as much about that, right? No pun intended, I guess. But um, but I'm realizing I want to I want I want to catch you know I want to I want to yeah I'm starting to hear that more and more. Maybe I need to rethink the idea of that, you know, in terms of well, especially the, the potential effects, those more severe effects. I agree with that. Um, but, I've, you know, like, for instance, I was talking to the superintendent uh, at Wheaton Warrenville South, which I was presenting on Tuesday, and he said, Matt, we're going we're to have you come and talk to our seventh graders, right? I'd, I'd be happy to do that. It's just a matter of linking me with, uh, with the right. Because the idea is getting this information, this counterbalancing information to young people before they try it, right? Which is a, a stitch in time, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But just one question. I didn't know I've been at school for years now. What is Jewel? So Jewel, I'm sorry. I, I should, probably should have been a little, I just assume nowadays everybody know, knows what Jewel is. So I thank you for that. I'll make sure to, to qualify that. So Jewel has been the most common over the past three or four years. It's been the most commonly sold and commonly used nicotine vaping device. And it looks like, I don't, I don't, uh, it's in my car. Um, so. I could, I could go grab it in my car, my, my, bag of va my bag of vapes. I'm like a drug dealer. Um, it looks like a, a flash drive. It's about yay long. Um, and it, it's, it looks like something that Apple would put out. Like it looks like an Apple vape, 
right? So it's very discreet, very small, easy to conceal, and so that's a big part of the reason why it's really taken off for the past few years is because of how discreet it is and how easy it is to, to get away with using it without getting caught and being able to hide it, so. I apologize to other people that may not know what Juul is. I hope most of you do, please, yes, no? Okay, good. Yeah, oh yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So there's some handouts at the table too. There's both handouts that the Commission on Youth put together, but then, yeah, the school, did, and then there's also a couple uh, Rosecrans handouts, one on uh, vaping and then another one on just our Chicagoland offices. If anybody, God forbid, needs an assessment for their son or daughter, we could, we could provide that, so. Oh, the other thing I want to mention, too, in terms of uh, the middle school, the, the video from tonight. I mean, if you want to talk about a very easily accessible way for, you know, maybe, maybe the school can, can use the, I'd be, I'd be fine with that. You don't have to bring me in in person, necessarily. Um, but there's ways to use that multimedia component in terms of a video from tonight. Maybe they want to show that at assemblies or in classes. You know, to me, that's the most important thing, is getting the information out to as many people as possible. Yeah. I would say or with alcohol, and this, this presentation could be misleading because I think it's easy to say that these are the primary issue. Alcohol still is the number one in terms of what, what young people will generally, if, if there's any drug they're more, most likely to try first, that it will be alcohol. But these two, when talking about nicotine vaping, marijuana vaping, they're catching up very quickly. They're not, they haven't surpassed it. So with alcohol, it's generally at some point in high school in the 30%, 30, 35% range. And then with these devices, it started in the 5 to 10% range. Now it's in the 25 to 30%. And the Illinois Youth Survey is being done in a lot of schools in these coming months. So I'll be really curious to see what the results look like. I wouldn't be surprised if it's somewhere up 30% in that, in that range. So hopefully that gives you kind of a ballpark sense. Obviously, when they're surveying you know, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders, you're going to see lower numbers, right? And then they're going to get higher as you go up to 12th grade. So if you average it out you're looking at about 20, 20 to 30 percent. Yep. Other questions? And, yeah, I was going to see any other questions for our fine folks over, over here? Here, take the mic. Hi, Jeannie. Um, so I think there's probably been more discussion about should Elmhurst decide to allow recreational, I, I'm going to think every time that I say that word now, recreational marijuana to be sold in town or not. And so that was one decision that was made. The council voted to not have um, retail marijuana, at least not yet. So there is a, a cutoff time that we could decide to opt out uh, we could still change. Is that, Nick, are you, you're not, yeah. And then, so, you know, it could come up again. Um, but the other decision that was made that I don't know if people followed as closely is that um, we had our city code mirror what uh, we have in the state. So it changes, um, we more recently changed our nicotine ordinances to also mirror that, so to go from 18 to 21. So we also added marijuana in there. So the underlying result is that um, if a somebody under age 21 is um, found using or uh, possessing marijuana or any paraphernalia, then our own um, city police can adjudicate it in the city and it doesn't have to end up on their record through the state. So it's just a different way to handle it and, you know, different procedures for um, possibly appear jury or other um, consequences. So that's what we just passed. Thanks. Anything else? Yeah. If you want to get rich, by the way, if anybody's looking for you, we're telling you right now. If you have a really strong science background. Well, it, you know, is the... Is the, is the question how are they going to know if they're pulled over or something? And do you guys want to answer that? You, 
you got uh, our SROs. Go ahead. Um, kind of what Matt said, obviously, yeah, there, there is nothing. Um, kind of to stick to the presentation and uh, what, um, you know, talking about the ordinances, everything for teens and Matt pretty much talked about, um, nothing has changed in the past year. Obviously, when we talk about adults, that could be a topic for a different day. Anybody's over 21, um, as far as the ordinances, things are obviously different um, since with the new law. But to answer your question, that's something that's in the, the process as far as detecting. Um, again, with driving under the influence of cannabis or any other drug, nothing has changed as well. Um, as far as detecting, um, there's a process as far as uh, standardized field sobriety testing um, with any other drugs. There's urine tests, there's blood tests. Um, this is prior to the new law. These have been laws that have been out there and still everything stays the same with that. Yeah, as far as the state law, I can't specifically yeah. speak to it, but, um, you know, there are. Again, I'm not, I'm not looking for it. Yeah. It's just, I can see that as a challenge for law enforcement. You know, I can consume it in my own home and, you know, have a toddler near me. Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, that's a good point, and that was um, part of the discussion at a public affairs and safety meeting, and not that example, but just the fact that there are scenarios that will probably come up and there isn't case law to look to. So a lot of questions and there are, you know, some criticisms of what's included in the state law, what's excluded, how things are explained. So, you know, I think it will see some evolution or maybe we'll see some other situations that'll come up that'll help guide people in the future. So That I don't know, so. Okay, all right. Thanks, okay. Of course, you're saying like the big devices seem all not all that scary or dangerous. Well, a little gummy bear seems even less scary or dangerous. Yeah, and, and I, I didn't I didn't get into that, so it's 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 yeah. Well, the, the, there's a couple primary issues that come up with the edibles. One is that the the dosing from edible to edible. If they're, if they're not coming from the same batch or product, can vary widely in terms of the potency. So you could have somebody that might have, have had some experience using a lower dose edible, where maybe they were able to use three of them and be okay, and they might then try something that it's a higher potent, you probably know where I'm going with this, where they'll try something that they don't realize, it looks maybe even looks the same, but it's a higher, much higher dosage and it, and it can, can hit them like a ton of bricks. The other, the other issue is there's a delayed effect because of the way edibles are ingested through the stomach. It's a much more, there's much more of a delayed effect because of the, when it's ingested, versus vaping it or smoking it, it's just one to three minutes. Versus when you ingest edibles, there's a much more significant delayed effect where it can be 45 minutes, an hour or more before it kicks in. So what you hear about time from time and time again with young people, even with adults that don't have, and I, I think you'll, you'll hear more and more stories about this, and you're already starting to. Have you, have you heard the stories about the ER spikes in, in Illinois and increases emergency room visits relative to marijuana? A significant portion of those are adults that are using edibles as they're kind of dipping their toe into the water into this and not recognizing that there's a delayed effect so they take one and they wait a half hour, nothing happens, so they take more. And if it's a young person, they, you know, they won't take just one more, they'll take five more, right? And all of a sudden, two, an hour, two hours later, they're in a world of hurt. Sometimes they're having psychotic episodes, really significant panic and real significant mental health issues going on where they end up having to go to the ER. So that delayed effect is another really significant thing to be aware of when it comes to edibles as well.
not really. A lot of it, they might, they, they might, prescri they might, prescri they might prescribe like a, a, an IV drip of like a, a low, low dose like benzo benzodiazepine to kind of just, but a lot of it's just time, unfortunately. But I've heard so many stories from young parents, with, especially with these high potency marijuana products, where they have that kind of psychotic episode. And the scary thing about it is that they'll tell me this happened six months ago and they haven't been the same since then. That's what scares me, is when there's a lingering, there's a lingering effect from it that lingers for months afterward. That's what scares me is when I hear about that. It'll give you the potency, and if it's and if it's purchased from one of the you know recreational and medicinal, it, it should be lab tested. It should be generally accurate. But again, if you haven't done it before, what's your frame of reference going to be? Do you know what I mean? And if you think when they're passing them around, they're talking about well, what's the dosage on that? Have you met a teenager? Right, they're not talking about the dosage. So, and, and the dosage varies wildly, just in terms of how strong these edibles can be. Can yeah. Question? Yeah, I'll stick around. Thanks for coming. I love this room, because sometimes the new presentations are in five, 500, 500 seat auditoriums, and there's 40, this is much cozier, you know, versus a, huge auditorium with 30 parents and a 500 room auditorium, so I appreciate it. Matt, thank you so much. Beverly's gonna wrap up and answer that question about maybe what we can do at the schools. Uh, there were several of you who mentioned what can we do at the middle school level. That has not gone unnoticed at all of our presentations. We wanna make sure that we're pushing that information back down. So allow us to take the video back. We'll make sure that it gets uh, ready to go. We'll post it on our YouTube channel so that you can use it at home. And then we'll see how we can also package that and use it at the middle school level if we need to. Or bring in another speaker. Yes, ma'am. Those are places where we can do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. We will, we will work on that. Thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate you so much. Have a great night. I count, you, you count, count, everyone, everyone counts, counts Elmhurst. Elmhurst. The city of Elmhurst is home to over 45,000 residents. But the U.S. Constitution mandates that everyone in the country be counted every 10 years. The United States counts everyone living in the country on April 1st, regardless of their nationality or living situation. Completing the census is mandatory. It's a way to participate in our democracy and say, I count. Taking part is your civic duty. The census is about fair representation at the federal level. Every 10 years, the results of the census are used to determine how many seats each state gets in the House of Representatives. After each decade census, congressional, state, and local legislative district boundaries are redrawn to account for population shifts, including Elmhurst ward boundaries. The census is a snapshot in time. It aims to count the entire population of our country and the location each person usually lives. The census asks questions of people in homes and group living situations, including how many people live or stay in each home, as well as the sex, age, and race of each person. The goal is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. When you respond to the census, you help Elmhurst get its fair share of the more than $675 billion per year in federal funds spent on schools, hospitals, roads, public works, and other vital programs. Federal funds, grants, and support to states, counties, and communities are based on population totals and breakdowns by sex, age, race, and other factors. The community benefits most when the census counts everyone. The census is a valuable tool for improving communities across the country. 
funds distributed from the census equate to approximately $6 million annually for the City of Elmhurst. That allocation provides funding for local projects such as road resurfacing and supports community initiatives from public safety preparedness to quality of life and economic development growth. If members of the community don't respond to the census, Elmhurst may not receive the funding it deserves. Your census responses are safe and secure. The Census Bureau is required by law to protect any personal information collected and keep it strictly confidential. Your answers may only be used to produce statistics. They cannot be used for law enforcement purposes or to determine your personal eligibility for government benefits. To be clear, there will not be a citizenship question and respondents will not be required to submit their social security number. 2020 will introduce the first modern census, the first to be available online. The days of the old-fashioned, long-form census are over. Because getting an accurate count is so important, the process is designed to be fast and easy. On average, it takes no more than 10 minutes to answer the questions on the census. Beginning in March 2020, when it's time to respond, households will receive an invitation in the mail from the U.S. Census Bureau. Every household will have the option of responding online, by mail, or by phone. Households that don't respond in one of these ways will be visited by a census taker to collect the information in person. In the 2010 census, only 86% of Elmhurst households responded. You can help create a better future for Elmhurst by responding to the 2020 census. Providing an up-to-date and accurate count of our population is critical. With an accurate snapshot of the Elmhurst community, the Park District is able to plan, budget, and develop new parks and programs that will be beneficial to the Elmhurst community. An estimated 5% of children under the age of 5 weren't counted in the 2010 census. Census results help us understand how demographics, including income, education levels, and population size, are changing in Elmhurst. Having an accurate picture of all residents, including children 5 and younger, allows District 205 to engage in long-term planning to meet the needs of current and future students. The Elmhurst Public Library, Elmhurst School District 205, the Elmhurst Park District, and City of Elmhurst are committed partners in making sure all of Elmhurst is counted accurately in the 2020 Census. Each week leading up to the Census deadline, you can learn more about your fellow Elmhurst residents who are likewise committed to being counted in 2020. Join us in being counted. Remember the census counts all people living or staying at an address, not just the person or family who owns or rents the property. So be sure to include your entire household. To learn more about the U.S. Census, local programming, and where to find assistance in responding to Census 2020, please visit the city's website, elmhurst.org census 2020.